Um, all right, now it's red. Okay. Take two. Take two. Welcome. Synchronizing Art with Technology Data Integration at the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. Uh, we're going to be talking about data syncing and all of that fun stuff. So if that's not what you're here for, then I don't know. Enjoy. Uh, first of all, who am I? Uh, my name is Pete Inge. I'm a senior systems architect at Blue Cadet. Um, Blue Cadet is the agency that worked on the project for Eamon Carter. I probably should have put that in the title, but that's okay. Um, I've been working at Blue Cadet for a little over eight years. Uh, before that, I freelanced. I've been working in Drupal since uh, D5, Drupal 5. Um, and so, yeah, I've been doing that for a little while. Uh, freelance, so I was doing a lot of different things, but a whole lot of web work. And at Blue Cadet, uh, I now deal with a lot of the CMS work, mostly in Drupal, and we deal with a lot of data. Um, Blue Cadet, uh, our thing is Blue Cadet is a redefining visitor experience for the world's most creative businesses, brands, and cultural institutions. Our work ranges from designing visitor centers and immersive exhibition installations, developing comprehensive web platforms and digital tools. Basically, we are not just a web shop. We uh, do a lot of in-person experiential work, or in-museum experiential work. Uh, so we're using a lot of Drupal and other CMSs to uh, handle data and pushing that all to that. And we do websites as well. And a little bit about Eamon Carter. Um, I'll let you read that whole thing, but uh, it's a nice museum in Texas, uh, American Art Museum, medium-sized museum. Um, a really pretty cool collection there. Um, and we partnered with them uh, about five years ago, four years ago, to uh, redo their website. And then part of that was to create this collection explorer that we'll be talking about today to sync their data. So first of all, to get started, um, what is data syncing? Um, sorry, also, just a side note, I, I've been playing a lot with AI imagery. So hopefully it's better than looking at uh, code and database tables and stuff like that. But um, yeah, hopefully uh, enjoy that. But what is data syncing? Um, so first of all, the way that I would talk about it, we're talking about bringing external data into your site for a specific purpose. Um, specifically for this project, you know, we're bringing it to create um, an explorer that people can see their collection. Um, basically for this, we are like maintaining in two independent sources so that you have your source where your data is coming from, then you have your website as well, uh, and you have that source of data in there. Um, for this, you're typically maintaining your data structure, but that's not necessarily a requirement, but typically happens. Um, and it's not a migration. So I think it's a little bit of a picky distinction, but um, migration is definitely something different than data syncing. Uh, migration, we usually have another source. We're moving data from there into our website. We're usually changing it a lot. If you're doing a typical Drupal migration, you're changing your fields, you're changing all that kind of structure. So a um, little bit picky, but also just why we're talking about this today, um, it is a little different. Um, so why are we talking about this today? Well, first of all, we're at a conference. That's what we do. Um, the, the big thing here is current state of technology. This is new, but we have data everywhere, microservices, all this stuff. We have access to it. People have a huge computer in their pocket. Um, Part of that is we are just getting to be a technological place. Um, we've seen, at Blue Cadet, we've seen a surge in organizations wanting to, wanting to digitize. Um, the pandemic has really kind of caused a little surge in that as well. Um, but organizations are realizing and putting the money and the time and effort uh, behind digitizing uh, whatever it might be. And um, Drupal is honestly a great platform for handling these larger things. It's uh, all the structured data. Uh, it's just a great thing to be using. Also, specifically with museums, um, a typical museum has about 95% of their collection in storage. And this, the first time I heard this, I thought the number was wrong. Like, that is a huge number. Um, but yeah, typically, there is just so much that the public can't see from an art collection. Um, whether they're just duplicates of, of things or just less important or they can't actually physically put it out in space, uh, in, in their space, um, there's just a lot of artwork and all the stuff around collections that uh, the public can't see. Um, obviously, there's other reasons for data syncing, but we're talking about art museum today. Um, so to start, this was, um, we have a less technical client, so they didn't come with us to, uh, with a list of things that we had to do and what they wanted. Um, I pulled this from our SOW, um, but we were creating an easy to use accessible collections explorer. Uh, and this was really to extend their in-gallery experience, like that was their point. Um, so we had a lot of fun trying to figure out what they wanted, how they wanted to do it, how we should be doing it. 
Um, and so, yeah, that was a fun process of, of figuring this all out. We came down to syncing their whole collection, um, and that was fun. So first of all, we were in uh, Drupal 8. That was the CMS we were building. Our first phase, we kind of built a, a very small site, a couple web pages, um, and then we were building that out. We are hosted on Pantheon. Uh, their collection data is all in Emu, and their DAMS is in Piction, so we were dealing with that. And for the actual Explorer, we were using Pantheon Search, um, which is basically Solar. They're using a, an instance of Solar. And then what we were looking at was almost 62,000 artworks uh, the size of their collection. They have about 24,000 archive objects, so this is like not fine art, but I'll show you an example here in a minute. Um, artists, creators, uh, 19,000 of those. Um, so we're looking at you know a little over 100,000 data objects, um, 100,000 images and PDFs. We had a lot of PDFs for the archive work. Um, so it wasn't a massive amount of data, but it was a decent amount to, to think about with speed and performance and all that. So here's just a little example of the actual collection explorer that we've ended up with. Um, fun front end, and yeah, it's fun to showcase their artwork. Uh, the one thing I, I, I think I forgot to mention, a um, couple of museums that we worked with, when we do these collection explorers, they're, um, we heard more than once that this is the first time they've seen their entire collection at a glance, um, which I think was really cool and really fun to be a part of. Um, you have these collection databases in their back end, but a lot of people don't really have access to it in the museum. Um, and it's very curatorial, you know, it's very data-centric. Um, so it's fun to be able to, to get this out in a fun and useful way. So here, uh, just an example of one of the artworks. Um, I don't know why, but I like this fish called saw picture, and I use this as my test object a lot. Um, archive objects, like I said, this, this stuff was really cool because it's not artwork, but this is a, a receipt of something. But they have like these notes and just yeah, cool objects. So a lot of PDFs behind this archive work. So not just imagery, we're dealing with documents as well. Um, but yeah, the archive stuff was fun. And it's interesting, like the artist like has notes to their the, who was casting their sculpture and stuff. And it's like I don't know, it's just neat to see. Um, I often with cultural institutions, um, I spent more than one afternoon just looking at their collection rather than actually doing my work. Um, <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. Then, yeah. Uh, artists. For some reason, they don't like images for their artists, but we have a lot of artists and creators. They call them creators because it's also like the boundaries um, that are casting the artworks and stuff like that. And then we brought exhibition data in. Um, this is a little bit different process than everything else, but um, yeah, it was part of the process. So let's uh, dive into the details. Um, at a high level, I like to break syncing and figuring it out in three different steps, and we will start with that. Um, so first, we want to define the constraints and the state of what we're dealing with. Um, as with any developer, and you're trying to figure out a problem, hopefully you're knowing what you're, what you're doing to get into it. I would also say here, uh, document as much as you can, um, and document the why. Uh, you'll hear me say it a couple slides. I don't remember. Um, and so we made some decisions. I remember making the decision I don't always remember why, um, and that might come back later when you have to deal with problems down the road. Uh, second, decide on uh, strategy. Like, how do we want to execute the process? There's um, Drupal, technology, web, everything. There's like a million ways of doing everything. Half of them are probably okay, you know. So we have to decide on the strategy. Third, decide on the right tools. Again, with Drupal, we have a lot of modules. It's all contrib. You can write your own custom code. What is the right tool to handle everything? So. Uh, state and constraints. Second is executed strategy. Third is the right tools. So uh, let's walk through um, the project a little bit. So one of the things too with a lot of museums that we deal with, uh, we don't have to worry about instantaneous real-time updates. That in itself is a whole another thing. Um, but a lot of museums, you know, we're dealing with nightly syncs or you know, they just want the updates in 24, 48 hours type of thing. Um, so that's one thing that's really cool, or, or helpful, I should say, for us. Um, the Carter's IT team had uh, this pipeline set up already for their collection data going to their dams and connecting everything to their dams. So that was a big part that we didn't have to worry about, and we were only looking really at one source for their artwork and art objects. 
and archive objects. Um, this was kind of a custom endpoint, um, so it was a custom data structures. It was in JSON, so that was really nice to work with. Um, but you know, there was no contrib module that we could hook up to their dams and have all the data come in. Um, so we had to, you know, so there was custom stuff here we had to deal with. And this was the fun part. One of the constraints was that there was a low volume of updates. When a client tells you this, don't ever trust them on that. <laughs> I just finished the second full collection sync in two and a half months. So that was, this has been the whole three years since we've launched. Um, it's been pretty pretty frequent. So um, yeah, don't ever trust them when they say that. Uh, and didn't need immediate updates. So like I said before, um, we didn't have to worry about real-time updates if they edited something. Uh, Eamon Carter specifically was like 48 hours. That was kind of like the window that we had to hit, um, which was pretty easy. Um, and this is the other one. Uh, wanted all the imagery in the CMS. Um, and I can't, this is the one I can't remember why we made the decision. Decision. It really could have been a whim or there was reasons behind it. Uh, the dams that they had was really just asset management. It wasn't uh, a CDN at all, so we couldn't use the imagery straight from the dams. Um, but I, this is, it's been bothering me because we're dealing with a bunch of image issues right now. And uh, I can't remember the actual why. And I think it was just like, yeah, let's, get, let's have everything in the CMS. Um, and hopefully that's all it was because I'm going to be making some big changes soon. Um, second, decide on the execution strategy. So there's a lot of ways of, of doing all this stuff. Um, and yeah, one of them I'll, you know, is using live external endpoints. Um, overall, especially on a, a larger scale, I don't know how much I would recommend this, but there's definitely some really good use cases for, for doing this. Um, one of them I'll show you here, we work for the Henry Ford Museum. Um, and as I mentioned, Blue Cadet, we do a lot of uh, in-museum work. And so this is the editor experience. And we are, uh, Henry Ford had a number of APIs, uh, so we were, connected to them live to edit all the content and enhance that data uh, for these ex this experiential work that we were we were doing. So this is using live external endpoints. Uh, again, it's kind of on the admin experience, so you don't have hundreds of thousands of front end users all the time. Um, but that is a, a use case for that. Uh, this was not an option for Eamon Carter. Uh, another option, we can kind of save raw data and process on the fly. Um, so this, you know, is just an example of, of saving a bunch of JSON. A um, couple use cases for this. Uh, we have one museum that we did a few years ago that uh, we, you, they only had a couple hundred objects. It wasn't that large. Um, so we had their collection explorer all on a JSON. And then it was, I think, a React front end. Um, and that was just handling everything on the fly. We didn't really have to save a whole lot to uh, Drupal. Um, another thing, too, one that I'm dealing with right now, could be one or two. Um, we're just using fallback content from Wikidata. So if you think about it a little bit, if, uh, well, let me think, it's a short description of, of uh, an artist. So there's a field in the database that a content author can fill in. There's the field from the collection that they have, and then we're using it as a fallback, uh, the Wikidata bios as a fallback. Um, so really like the most prominent st people that they're gonna be showing on the web, they're gonna be filling in all that data. So how much processing of all this wiki data do we want to do when you have one of these artworks that's probably looked at once or twice a year? Um, so yeah, one of these one of these options are pretty good for, for that type of stuff. And yeah, the other thing, then just bringing all of the data into Drupal. Um, nodes, taxonomies, um, I always say Drupalize, you know, we want to Drupalize it. Um, put it into Drupal data structures, Drupal is very, opinionated about how, how data structures are. Um, but you can also then use all your data within Drupal very easily. Um, to do, yeah, so for Eamon Carter, we brought all the data into uh, Drupal, and there are a number of reasons for that. This is actually live footage of us building fields. Uh, not live, uh, recorded of us while we were doing it. Um, I think I got a lot of things. Um, these stadiums, I feel like if you've ever seen these stadiums or these videos, they're actually really crazy. Um, but yeah, why, why did we choose to do this? Um, so one, we needed to use this data 
uh, the artwork specifically through other content on the site. Uh, content authors were going to be creating articles and blog posts and stuff, and we needed to relate data. We needed to pull in the imagery. We needed to do all this kind of stuff. So this data wasn't in a silo. If we didn't have to, if that data didn't have to touch anything else in the CMS, um, another option is, would be totally viable, but we were using it in Drupal like we wanted to use Drupal. Um, content was going to be enhanced in the CMS, like I mentioned. Um, we can add more content to it. Uh, so a few things with this. The, the collection data is usually very curatorial focused, um, and it's pretty dry and that kind of stuff. So um, for some of these museums that we have, we enhance that data. We have the ability for content authors to add more content um, and put stuff on top of their actual collection data. Um, another good example for Eamon Carter, they're using, they have a lot of educational material, um, but it's not in their collection data. It's all on the website. So we uh, are using that to enhance all of the artwork data as well. Um, content was going to be indexed uh, through the search API, so Drupal search API. Uh, like I said, we were using Solar. Um, at the time that I was making this decision, I used search API a decent amount, but it was really all kind of point and click. I was configuring it a lot, um, so I really didn't understand the, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, but that was one of the decisions of why we were fielding everything. I thought it would just be a whole lot easier if everything was fielded. And yeah. So um, we'll, we then wanted to look at the tools. How are we going to do this? What are there, our options for being able to um, migrate all this data or sync all this data? Well, obviously, there's the migrate module in Drupal, a very good module. The, um, the history, the origins of Migrate are really dealing with Drupal to Drupal. Um, but as with Drupal, it is, you can do a whole lot of things with it um, at this point, and uh, it's very handy for a lot of uh, reasons. We also have the feeds module. Um, again, this one, you know, the, the history of this, you know, coming from RSS, XML feeds, dealing with that, but we can do a whole lot more around it now. Um, and it's great for, for bringing in um, data itself. This is definitely more syncing, Migrate's more migration. Feeds is more uh, is uh, is able to handle syncing a lot better. Um, we also have custom code. So when you're dealing with custom code, um, you want to uh, figure out the, the effort behind it. Um, is it how much is going to take um, compared to using a contrib module? If you use a contrib module, you might not be able to do everything you want. So you're still going to have to add something on. So how do you make that decision? Um, do you want everything on it? The other thing with custom code too is thinking about the technical debt. Um, do you want to put the technical debt on a contrib module and have them update the module all the time, or do you want your own devs uh, to deal with that and, and handle that? Um, yeah. So for Amin Car, oh, another one, external to CMS. Yeah. So this one, I felt like I had to put in here regardless, but there's a huge caution around this. Um, as with anything with Drupal, you know, you don't really want to touch the database outside of what Drupal is doing. Um, but I'll go through just a couple things that we're, we could think about. Um, you definitely don't want to like try to create a node by writing directly to the database. You want to let Drupal kind of be Drupal and do what it does. Um, but you might have custom database tables or something like that, and you can then have an external source kind of write to the database. Um, for Eamon Carter, the exhibitions, uh, we had very large XML files. Um, so the uh, emu was writing those XML files to the file directory. And then the website itself was, the CMS was then grabbing all that data and bringing in the exhibition data. So that was sort of external, um, but the actual data was all CMS processes. And for this, we chose the custom code. Um, obviously, I like to... <laughs> I like to reinvent the wheel. Um, I want to do the code regardless, um, obviously, because I can do it better, and I think I can do it faster, but that is usually not what happens. Um, it's kind of funny because my, my boss is right here, and we have this conversation every three months of, I just I need to write it myself. I just need to do it myself. Like, we're not going to do contrib. And then, uh, yeah, we do contrib. Uh, except for some of these bigger stuff. We'll we do custom side, yeah. Anyways, but um, so this is just one of the diagrams that we have of the the pipeline, uh, the timing and queuing of these updates with Eamon Carter um, was interesting. I'll put it that way, and so we had to do a lot of custom code just to be able to get the data. So that was one of the reasons why we started down the road of custom code, 
and it actually, we just did the rest of it in custom code. Um, to bring in that data itself, once we got the updates that we needed from the API, uh, we would grab the data, the objects, add it to a queue worker in Drupal, and process the item in the queue at a later time using cron. Um, so this code right here is just um, running through a queue factory. If you aren't familiar with queues in Drupal, um, and you do any kind of custom processing in general, I would say really understand what queues and queue workers and all that is. Um, it's very, very handy. Um, yeah, that's all I have time. Uh, actual ingestion of data could have been feeds or migration. Um, would have required a lot of tampering around it or uh, processes for migration. Um, I find when I go down those routes with those modules, there's always that one piece of like custom data that is just not going to work in feeds or migrate. We need to do something with it. So I find myself always writing custom code regardless if I'm using migration module or the feeds module. Um, so this is when I go back and forth all the time. The, this is one of the whiteboard things we had one time of trying to figure out what to do. Um, and yeah, I as a developer, Drupal developer, and having a Drupal product, I really want to have a Drupal product. I want to go the Drupal way, but um, and use the contrib modules so that you know when I pass this on, another developer will be able to handle it. But we also have complex things that are very specific, so we need to to balance that out. Um, so, quick recap on all of this. So, we needed a collection explorer. We brought all the data into Drupal entities, nodes, and taxonomies. And um, yeah, we had a lot of custom code to handle this um, processing and syncing all of the data itself, and then um, uh, queuing up all the data and then processing and handling the data itself. So, a uh, couple things of what we learned. Well, dealing with images and files. Um, text and JSON files are very easy to process and quick. Uh, images themselves and PDFs uh, are not, are often large files. Um, so how do you want to handle your files? Um, especially our decision of bringing everything into the CMS. Um, again, if there was a, 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 def a definitive reason for doing that, great. But um, yeah, you want to figure out how you're going to handle all of that. Uh, how to detect new images. So this is another thing we dealt with. Uh, their naming structure for files was uh, based on the artwork, piece of artwork. So you can look at file size, but it was really like there was this edge case of they could update an image and we might not know about it in the data. So we had to figure out um, what to do with that. We initially were just uh, bringing in a new image every time we synced. Um, again, on another low volume of updates, this should have been okay, but we click, quickly uh, filled up our AWS bucket pretty pretty quickly. Um, so we had to deal with that uh, and deal with that. That was fun also too. We didn't initially launch with AWS. We were on Pantheon, like I said, and we moved all of our files over to AWS because of the large amount of files that we had. Yes? Just so, the source for all of this stuff is their name, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so they have the, the, collect, the data is in their emu, is in their collections. They have a process that moves all that data and then the actual files into their dams, and then all of the API endpoints uh, is in the dam itself. But nobody thought to put like an updated at timestamp on things on that side. I will um, not bit. answer that question at the moment. <laughs> 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 while, while we're recording, we'll talk later. No, I, yes, not like, so we didn't have any control over that. We right. had suggestions, options for all that kind of stuff. Um, I had a meeting actually last week that there's a unique ID for each of the files. We, we were told it wasn't unique. Um, so that's my fix this week, uh, or next week. Um, so yeah, that, that was a part, that was an interesting part of it. Um, yeah, and like we're dealing with that external endpoint. We don't, we can't control it. Um, so there's always that part. We made suggestions, we asked for certain things. Um, but yeah, ideally you want to have good data that you're, you're grabbing information from. Uh, custom code. So when you're dealing with a lot of custom code, um, error catching and handling is always a big part of everything, obviously. We want to catch errors, we don't want um, to have to deal with all that. Uh, when you're dealing with 100,000 objects, you can't test all 100,000 objects. 
before you go live, necessarily. Um, we have our, yeah, you can, you can test it. Um, but yeah, you want to be able to catch those errors. You want to be able to understand and be able to debug what you can, uh, what the problems are. Um, and I would also say proper reporting for what does fail. Uh, so we were catching things, but we had no clue what was failing. So uh, initially, we lost a, I don't know a few hundred objects, and I had no clue like why why they didn't sync. Um, so when writing cups of code, really throwing in those try catches, but also give yourself some help and put some good messages in there so that you know what uh, is failing and why it's failing. Uh, reliability of the external data sources, going for that. Uh, availability and speed. Um, so what happens when your process is just assuming that that third party is always gonna be there and it's always gonna respond on time? Um, you shouldn't make that assumption. Um, there's sometimes when that external data source doesn't perform very quickly. Uh, so dealing with that and being able to fall back and handle all of that. Um, also the, the external API was quite slow, so we had to figure out how to ingest slowly, which was also another fun part. Um, dates, going back to the, the custom code caching. Uh, dates are always fun in general. And um, we had a text field that was a date. And it was just a, a plain text field. And 99% of their collection was great. It was a couple different formats of dates, but it was a, it was a text field. And then every now and then there was a, uh, like spring of 1945, and like how do you how do you really throw that into a date field? And this is one of the things where we had a bunch failing, and this was actually like, because we couldn't process that string, it failed the whole object being imported. And this is the one I like I could not figure out for the life of me, um, and it took a while, and that was just throwing in the right right error messages and catching that code correctly. Um, but dates dates in general are always fun, and time zones and dealing with all that. Um, hopefully, I, there's a couple chuckles. Hopefully, you've all experienced that pain as well. Um, Pre-caching. Uh, so this was a really fun thing to kind of play with and get into. Um, caching in Drupal is there's a lot, and I feel like I could be a professional with it. In fact, the the talk I was at right before they have he does a course, a Drupal course, and he said he spent two weeks on caching for Drupal. And I was a little surprised with that, but also there's just a lot around caching. Um, so what, what can you do with caching with, when you're dealing with these kind of data sinks? Um, we have these objects, you know, art collections, artwork itself is not gonna change a whole lot. Um, once the painting's done, it's, it's painted, it's there. Um, so our big thing for, for this, uh, we have these, you know, the teaser views in the collection. Um, it's the painting, it's the artist, it's the title. When is it going to change? So we can cache all of that and um, really kind of speed up things with Drupal um, by a being able to put that in there. Also, we were using uh, kind of a permanent cache, so it doesn't get cleared every time Drupal clears its cache. Um, so we can set up a lot of, of that data while we're doing the sync itself. Um, so we don't want to just think about bringing in the data and just being there, but also what can we do with that data to, to have our site perform better um, later on. Any questions or thoughts on that? Cool. Um, so, some of the, the future thoughts and strategies that we're thinking about. Um, again, as we do um, a lot of these syncs and dealing with data, um, we are, I always have thoughts of how can we do this better. Um, one of the things with Amon Carter, we brought all of that data into the artwork node, and then all of that enhanced data that we talked about is on the same node. So, every time we do a revision, um, all of that sync data is getting part of those revisions as well. Um, I'm not sure that was the best strategy, but that's what we did at the moment. Um, but one of these is bringing our, our sync data into a separate entity or a node itself, it could be, but then connecting that to that enhanced data node. Um, that way you're dealing with revisions for the content that's in Drupal and the sync data uh, can be separate and, and kept to its own. Um, dealing with that, you know, Drupal loading a node and loading all those fields, and if you have actual structure, you're talking about paragraphs and you're talking about all this other stuff, um, that can be a lot and be heavy. Um, so this is one thing, personally, I really want to test and get numbers on. I keep, that keeps getting punted. Um, but yeah, how, how much does that load really affect your node and, and loading all of that and handling all of that data? Some of these are, some of these things, you know, the object itself, we have 50, 60 different fields 
uh, taxonomy terms, all that kind of stuff. There's just a lot of data that could be there. Um, so how, how really should we be handling that data? Um, this is another one too, the current project I'm working on. Um, the structure that the data is in, we would have a ton of paragraphs or however else you want to handle all of that type of data. Um, there's just a lot going on, but we really don't need a lot of that data. There's no, no real reason that we need that in Drupal. We need the artwork, we need to be able to reference the artwork, but the actual data that we're bringing in um, doesn't, need, doesn't need to be Drupalized, doesn't need to be in those fields. So we, we're creating our custom tables. We can easily and quickly uh, read and write um, to those tables. Uh, we can kind of do that the Drupal way as well, like um, as far as like custom code versus like we're using the database connection, all that kind of stuff. So it's a little more Drupal-y in a way. Um, speeds up the syncing. The syncing process, we're not um, having to deal with entities and, and creating nodes on the fly and all that kind of stuff while we're syncing. We're just writing, um, taking JSON, you know, creating an array and, and writing that to the database. At the moment, it's currently speeding up uh, development time. So instead of creating that node and dealing with all of that work behind it, um, I'm throwing you know, a JSON object into three different tables. And then when I do need to bring all that into, J in, into Drupal, if I, if I need to, I don't know if I need to at the moment, but if I do, I can work on that later. Um, but now this, you know, I could get this part done, the, the initial part done in a week. We can show the client stuff already. It's actually, you know, it's been working out pretty well in that sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, so like I said, I, I, I would love to get some timing on this as well. Like, I, I would love to have those numbers because um, it'd be a little bit better to talk about. And caching. This is uh, what I was talking about a little bit earlier, the permanent cache bin module. Um, this, we started using this a lot for Amon Carter. Um, and for these large data sets, uh, it's coming out really well. The module itself seems to be fairly... Um, straightforward. Uh, it's not too difficult, so being able to do your own uh, caching strategy with this, if you don't necessarily want a permanent, permanent cache bin, but um, you wanted to to do your own caching strategy, uh, being able to have caching outside of Drupal's normal caching um, is a huge viable option and one that uh, we're going to be playing with a lot on our current project. And yes, yeah, search API. Um, so, like I said earlier, I was a configurer of Search API, but um, Search API has a lot of plugins. At the time, documentation around it, I had no clue what was going on, but we needed to, we could dive into, I finally dove, dove into and found these plugins that they have, um, and they're actually fairly straightforward once you figure it out. It takes a little bit to get into it, um, and this is just one of the plugins to expose uh, that data from the custom database table to search API, so we're not using Drupal fields for that. Um, the actual code is like the last 10 lines. Everything else is, you know, class and comments and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so if you're dealing with search API and getting that a lot, uh, having custom data or data that's not in your Drupal fields is actually, uh, you can expose that um, to search API and uh, it's kind of handy. And thank you. That is full talk. Um, thank you for questions, comments, discussion. I'd love to talk about that or hear anything. Yes. Actually, in order to search API mm -hmm. taxonomy, question one is, did the client provide you the taxonomy or did you help them conceptualize that? And question number two, to what extent are you using the taxonomy and search API as opposed to the custom mm -hmm. database fields you're talking about? Sure, yeah, and I'll repeat that uh, for the recording. Um, uh, did the client provide the taxonomies or do we help them? And uh, how are we indexing it, mean, basically? So, um, okay, so they provided their taxonomies. So they had all of their data uh, in EMU in their collection. Um, Eamon Carter, I don't think we really had like content strategy around it. Uh, the current client we're working on right now, we've been helping them and they're going through an effort of, of redefining their taxonomies. Um, so for Eamon Carter itself, they provide the taxonomy, we're bringing it all in. Um, they had their classifications. There was some fun hierarchy stuff that we had to deal with because uh, Emu, I think, as far as I understand, it was all like just text entry. It wasn't really a well-defined taxonomy system. Um, and then for actually bringing it into Solar, we were using the IDs so we could use them as uh, like facets and that type of thing, but also bringing in the text strings so that we could search on those strings as well and kind of weight those a little bit higher for searching. Um, and that's how we know that. Does that answer? 
Are you using all of their taxonomies or certain specific ones in search API? Uh, um, we're using all the ones that like we're using on the website. So we didn't ingest one or two of them, um, I think, at all, because we just didn't need it on the website. Um, but in the search API for the, the actual explorer, yeah, we were exposing everything that we had. Um, so we could use that to, to enhance the search. Yes? Uh, where are the derived presentation images created? On the DAM site or on the Drupal site? They are um, on the Drupal site, so we have uh, AWS bucket uh, to have all our images, but they're all being um, created in Drupal. And then they're permanently cached? Uh, yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So every time when we do sync and we change something out, then we're blowing that out at that point and then rebuilding it. But then we're keeping all of that cached. Your master, some of those are probably hundreds of megabytes big. Uh, yes, we are not bringing in the full image. Uh, we do have a, a, a max size for our images uh, because we're the end, we're the final part of the, that pipeline. Um, so we only need the largest that we need to present on the website. And so that was also another uh, constraint that was nice because we didn't have to bring in full size images. So the dam does have smaller. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The dam. The dam itself has. Um, I think it was like four different derivatives. Okay. Um, so that they were creating that, but yes, yeah, so we weren't bringing right, in the raw. Well, that'd be a very slow pipeline. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Terrifying. Yes. Yeah, it was all about what we were doing with uh, all the uh, revisions and images that we bring in. We hit three terabytes, um, and that was the lower size images, so yeah, we quickly fixed that. Yes? The custom tables bit. Mm -hmm. um, is, the, is, that, is that data served out via Drupal? Um, is the idea with that to yeah. speed up imports so then you can, that's sort of like a staging area and you can deal with it yep. as you need to later without having to run this big process that fuels everything and Drupalizes everything and takes a very long time. Is that sort of like to speed up the import? Yeah, so there's two, two parts right now. One, we have uh, relationships to the artists and all that kind of stuff, so we're putting that all on the table. Um, that's to speed up like not having to load all the nodes all the time and those connections. Um, but then there's a lot of like text that we're bringing in. We don't need to reformat it in Drupal. We don't need to use Drupal's formatters. Um, so we are presenting, well, we should be presenting that on the front end when we get everything done. But the idea is just present that text as is. We don't have to process it. We don't have to do anything else with it. No one's ever going to edit it. Um, it'll be edited in the collection um, database, and then that'll get synced to us. Um, so there's just, there's, at the moment, I don't know the reason to Drupalize all of that, you know, in that sense. So hopefully the idea is that that should speed it up. And um, also the data structure, the, the data that we're getting, um, to be able to do it right, like uh, we have paragraphs and multi-fields and all that kind of stuff. So it just seems like a lot of bloat for a couple text strings type of thing. Can you show the code that you have Yeah. How is that being developed? Um, I guess uh, we used to use Drupal for uh, backend, and then it was or some sort of uh, JavaScript. Yes, we did um, all vanilla JavaScript uh, for that front end. Um, wow, we had a couple more slides. There we go. Um, yeah, so we have a thing with views and accessibility. Um, so the thing with this was we don't want to use a view, uh, a speed as well. And um, so we have our own, we just created vanilla JavaScript to handle all this. Um, and then we're using uh, just a custom class to do the actual search um, and handling all of that. Um, but yeah, it's all, all vanilla JavaScript. There's um, some issues now. It's been live for a little while. And uh, we got to fix a few things. but. That's what the maintenance contract is for. To be fair, you could do this with a framework if you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And we've we've done things with React, you know, and other flavors of JS, uh, depending on the use case. Uh, but as Pete said, the accessibility requirements for this interface meant out of the box views were not. We would have to intervene a lot, and then, yeah, we. It felt 
like the right thing not to layer in a, a smaller application of React um, if we could if we could do it simpler uh, with vanilla JS. Yeah. Yeah, and this is yeah, this is one thing we were trying to like. We had the idea that we could we could do it better, um, and so that was why we did the vanilla JavaScript. Uh, the site that we did right before this, we, we did a React, and that was the one where they didn't have very many objects. We brought everything into just a JSON file, and then we could do everything in React, and that, that performs really well. That was that was great. This, um, I would love to spend six more months working on the performance side of it, but yeah, that's not part of the maintenance contract. Yes? Um, in the strategy, you didn't really elaborate much on it. Yep. Um, yeah, so everything's in AWS, so we're using uh, with, uh, CloudFront to, for the actual images. Um, so that CDN is there and um, handling that part. And then we're caching just the, the HTML to handle the actual uh, teaser, teaser view of the object itself instead of trying to render it on the fly. And what we were finding was um, just the normal Drupal caching. These uh, artworks were, you know, they're not viewed all the time. So if you do a, a, a unique search, you're always rendering that object, and you know it's never going to get cached, or it almost never gets cached because you're just not accessing it all the time. Um, so being able to cache that beforehand, then that saved a whole lot of time in the rendering process. And I like the cat. Like I said, the caching stuff. I feel like we could spend weeks and months on on figuring it out and optimizing that. And that's always been been fun to dive into. Anything else? Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, see you around the conference. If you have any more questions or anything, feel free to grab me.